All right, so uh, welcome to the spring 2016 semester and to the mechanical engineering department. Those of you who have never, who have never taken classes with me, um, uh, my name is Eduardo Devo, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go over my contact info in a minute. But before that, let me tell you about this class. This class we call Advanced Modeling Methods in Mechanical Engineering. The actual name that you'll see on Campus Solution and in the catalog currently is Advanced Modeling Methods with Applications in Bioengineering. Okay, I removed all of that with Applications in Bioengineering, made it general for Mechanical Engineering uh, because the stuff that we're going to cover here, all the modeling techniques that we're going to cover here apply to all uh, facets of Mechanical Engineering. Whether you're in solid mechanics or in thermal fields or in the fluid dynamics field, we're going to cover all that and see how we can frame everything and all these formulations into a single one. And I'm going to go over that in a minute. Okay, so so basically in next year's catalog, you'll see the name change and some changes in the catalog description as well. But what remains the same is the code, ME601, uh, and it's a three credit hour class. As I was mentioning, I taught, I teach a class in the fall semester which is eventually going to be ME501. Right now it's an experimental class and it's math and modeling methods in mechanical engineering. And that includes both, as the name implies, all the math techniques and all the modeling techniques uh, that are, in my, in my view, relevant to mechanical engineering phenomena and processes. So in this class in particular, uh, we are going to assume that the math is covered and we're just gonna concentrate on the modeling techniques, okay? And, uh, there's going to be a fair amount of uh, uh, formulations in the class and our own implementation. Basically, we're going to write our own code. Um, I'm going to use MathCAD uh, intensively. Uh, the reason I use MathCAD, and as you know from my other classes, is because I can actually write it on the spot, and it's what you see is what you get. You can just print plots and, and solve equations on the fly, but you're welcome to use any any mathematical spreadsheet of your choice, Maple, Mathematica, MATLAB, um, or high-level programming languages. If, if we go over, uh, we, might, we might actually get into some high-level programming if necessary or, or, or pertinent. So this class is uh, basically the development of a method of weighted residuals foundation framework for the formulation of finite differencing, finite volume, finite elements, boundary elements, and meshless collocation methods, okay? So what we're gonna demonstrate in this class is that all these methods are all related to each other, okay? When you use CATIA or when you use ANSYS, you're essentially using a finite element method engine. Behind or under the hood, there's a solver that uses a finite element method uh, to, to solve whatever problem you're, you're posing. Normally, it's an, elastic, it's an elastostatics problem. It's a solid mechanics problem. So you mesh it, uh, produce these little finite elements, and these equations are turned, these differential equations are turned into algebraic equivalents, which are then solved in a sparse matrix system into the resulting displacements or stresses and so on. Okay? When you uh, use a code such as Fluent, for example, or star CCM, or um, uh, CFX, uh, those are CFD codes, okay? Compu computational fluid dynamics. What you're basically doing is using a code that internally under the hood has a, has a core or an engine that uses a finite volume method. It doesn't use finite elements. It's another completely different technique called finite volume method. Uh, some other commercial code, uh, COMSOL and FEMAP, uh, use a combination of methods. Some other commercial codes that, you, that, that deal with acoustics and corrosion use the boundary element method. That is a completely different methodology that relies on boundary discretization and it has a completely different mathematical formulation. At the end, the idea of all numerical methods is to take a very complicated set of differential equations, partial differential equations, and turn it into an algebraic analog. What's originally a very complicated equation that a computer cannot deal with, you, using a methodology and a set of algorithms, you turn it into million of, millions of very simple arithmetic equations that the, that the computer is good at solving. The computer is very dumb. The computer can only solve very simple problems. Okay, arithmetic problems. So us, because we're smart, we take a complicated problem, make it easy for the computer to solve. The computer is good at solving very simple things very fast. So we give the computer the task of solving repetitively a million things 
very fast and spit the solution back to us. Okay? But all these techniques are completely different from each other. They're different in their mathematical formulation, they're different, different in their implementation, and uh, they're different in every sense. And what we're going to do is try to frame them all together into a single one, which we're going to call the method of weighted residuals. We're going to show and demonstrate that all of these can be traced back to a single framework, and, and basically we can derive from these basic framework, all of these different techniques, and show that how easy it can be to write a finite element code. Obviously, a simple one, because uh, the commercial ones are very, uh, very uh, fancy looking graphical user interfaces with, with uh, graphics and all kinds of things that we're not going to do this in, in this class. In this class, we're going to try to do just the algorithms and what's under the hood to solve very simple problems, okay? Um, so basically, in this class, we're not going to be using commercial software. If you want to use commercial software, you can do so to test whatever you're trying to do in the class, just for comparison, to see whether we're getting the right solution or not. But most of the problems that we're going to be solving in class already have an analytical solution, and an, an exact solution. So we have a basis for comparison to whether our solution algorithm is correct or not. Okay? So we are going to talk about principles and fundamentals of radial basis functions and their applications to global and local interpolation least squares and differentiation. So basically, we study the method of weighted residuals, the first portion of the semester, uh, make sure we derive all methods from that, and then we're going to concentrate specifically on the boundary element method, on the second portion of the semester, on, and on the last portion of the semester, we concentrate on meshless method. So the boundary element method, you're going to see in the, in, the, in the course calendar, we're going to, oh, I don't know if I actually printed that. This is going to be a problem. Oh, yeah, I did. So I'll show you when we get to the, to the contents of the class. So these are the course objectives, very standard, a set of objectives that's usually used for assessment. Uh, this is my contact information. I can be found in LB159 and uh, sometimes across the hall from LB159 is my lab, LB161, that's the multidisciplinary bioengineering lab. These are my office hours from 10 to 12 and from 2 to 3 p.m. I think that's a mistake. Yeah, that's fine. 2 to 3.30 p.m. I'm, and I have extra office hours for the other class from 3.30 to 5 p.m. So I'm in my office all afternoon on Mondays and Wednesdays. And if you cannot find me in my office, I'm across the hall in the lab in 161. And then the, during the other days, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm teaching. And, uh, and in the mornings, I'm in the lab, too, with the senior design groups and so on. And Fridays, I'm, I'm usually at UCF um, in my lab over there. So we meet here Tuesdays and Thursdays at 3.45 to 5 p.m. And uh, as in any other of my classes, I don't require a textbook, okay? I'm listing here a, a compendium of different references that could be uh, useful for the class, but I do provide a lot of uh, resources. I do provide um, uh, my own notes, uh, my own codes. Everything we do in class, you'll see on a PDF or on a code for download on, on Canvas. So there'll be plenty of material so it's necessary to actually work through, through the class. Anything else you might need, you can come and, bar and borrow, and if I have an electronic copy, I can give it to you. I do have electronic copies of some of these books, especially mine, but I I'm not supposed to share those. But um, maybe this one, it's 2003, I can, I, can give you the, I can give you the PDF. It's already expired, I think, the royalties, whatever. Um, so, uh, and I can give you individual papers or, or chapters of the different things in PDF. And I'll be posting also some handouts on Canvas for different during or along the, the course of the semester. So these are the three topics that we're going to cover. I just broken up the semester in three, as I usually do: the method of weighted residuals (MWR), the boundary element method, and meshless methods. That's it. Okay. Now there's obviously some specifics. Uh, this is a contribution to to the professional component 
of the program of the Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering or the PhD in Mechanical Engineering. Uh, this class is heavily basic in mathematics and in engineering, so it's where the three credit hours come from, and some relationship to the program outcomes. Uh, if this class could be interpreted as an undergraduate class, those are the undergraduate program outcomes, and that's a relationship. That's what the, the ones they mean. So don't pay much attention to that. It's just for internal assessment, and this is a, an official syllabus in ABA format. Um, the course grading. I've been um, mulling about the idea of grading this course. It's kind of difficult to grade a course like this, uh, but what we're going to do is to have three short projects, okay? Individual projects. One after the method of weighted residuals, one after BEM, and one after uh, meshless methods. Okay, something that you can do on your own, something that you can do using MathCAD or MATLAB or any spreadsheet of your choice, and then just report results and compare results to maybe some analytical solutions that I provide. Okay, and I thought that this was the most appropriate. It makes no sense to have tests in this class, exams. Um, so I, I think this, unless you want me to test you, I think this is <laughs> the best I could come up with. Uh, I taught a version of, of these class, a slightly modified version of these class at UCF, and, and, and it's, uh, it was challenging to, to grade in terms of, or assess basically, what is it that you can have the students do to demonstrate uh, that they are following up understanding the class. I cannot ask you to write a fine element code, but we can just do some 1D approximations and things like that that, that uh, make the point. And the standard grade distribution, which might not be relevant to us, hopefully everybody gets saved. And uh, if you get over 90, you get an A. Uh, there's just three individual course projects, and you'll see in the calendar that they are actually uh, scheduled or synchronized with the three parts of the semester and the materials. Uh, some formalities there on the syllabus. So again, this is a formal ABIT syllabus, so it has to, have to include all that stuff. Computer usage, obviously there's a lot of computer usage, library usage. Uh, excuse all, if you're going to miss a project, you have to let me know. Uh, course policies, make sure I take <laughs> plagiarism very seriously, make sure you don't use uh, projects from previous semesters, which you're not going to be able to because it's the first time this class is taught. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be challenging. But just make sure you do it individually. That's right. I, I allow everybody to work together, to uh, consult with each other. That's fine. That's natural. That's normal. But uh, the main outcome of your projects must be individual. All right? And your document, report, and conclusions, and so on. So no cheating. And just write in emails and the reports right in the professional in a professional manner. All right, so that's the end of the syllabus. Any questions on the syllabus? Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, so for the projects, you're assigning the, the actual thing we're doing? Yeah. Or, okay. yeah, so I'm gonna, I haven't figured it out yet, but what I'm gonna do is just uh, use, ask you to use one or, one or some of the methodologies that we developed uh, and solving a particular pro problem using this particular set of parameters, maybe this discretization of this set of discretizations, and then plot the results, compare them to exact solutions, and find residuals and things like that. Okay. All right. So this is how we are going to, and this is how I, I plan to break up the semester. Um, so the first part is all about the method of weighted residuals up until uh, the second week of February. And the first project is due Thursday to 11 in my office. <coughs> so we might not have class that day to allow you uh, some extra time to work on the project. And then you just bring the project to my office. So the days we have projects probably, or projects due, probably we don't have class. So I'll announce that when the time comes. Um, and, and basically the project's going to be on this material. So we'll see how do we formulate the method of weighted residuals, how do we um, then 
reclassify the method where residuals as co-locations, subdomain, galerian, and least squares, and how each of these actually leads to the finite differencing method, the finite volume method, the finite element method, and how do we get to, for example, the boundary element method. I'm going to do that in particular here. And how do we get to the meshless method? And I'm going to do this in particular right here after project two. So section number two is basically, uh, as again, uh, formulating collocation uh, method weight residuals on the boundary integral equation to give rise to the boundary element method. And then we talk about numerical implementation. And we're going to implement it for steady heat conduction problems. Very simple cases, okay? We're going to stay there and steady heat conduction problems because that's what boundary element is good for. Boundary element is a very elegant technique, mathematically very uh, rigorous. It's very, very precise. It's orders of magnitude more accurate and precise than finite elements. It's a technique that reduces the discretization to the boundary. Basically, you don't have to mesh the interior of anything. You only mesh the surface, the surrounding surface of a problem. So from the numerical implementation point of view, it's a tremendous advantage because you basically reduce the dimension of the problem by one. So if a problem is 3D, you don't have to worry about creating 3D cells inside the domain. You only worry about creating surface cells, which are 2D cells, basically. That's what boundary element does. It reduces the dimensionality of the problem by one. But as it is elegant and rigorous and advantages from the implementation point of view, it has a lot of limitations. And some of those limitations are that it, can, it only works well for a subset of very linear, very nicely behaved problems. If you try to apply boundary elements to uh, CFD, to the Navier-Stokes equations, which are the equations that govern fluid mechanics, then you run into a lot of problems. Okay? And then you end up doing approximations and things that kind of detract from the advantages of boundary elements. So we stick with what boundary element is good for. It's good for heat conduction, it's good for acoustics, okay? And it's also good for linear elastic problems, small deformation elastostatic problems. Once you get into large deformation field plasticity, it doesn't work. One thing that it's really, really good for, but obviously we're not, we don't have the time to, to go over that, and I can give you some papers that I've written in the past, is for <coughs> fracture mechanics, okay? Fracture mechanics, cracks, and crack propagation is a problem that is um, inherently singular, because at the tip of the crack, you actually have an actual singularity, a mathematical singularity. And the only method that is capable of capturing that appropriately is the boundary element method, because the boundary element method is a singular method. It's a method that, that is based on a boundary integral equation that is singular in, inherently. Okay? So it's a natural type of problem for, for boundary elements. But we're going to stick to the simple heat conduction problem. And then when we, would, when we move to meshless method, we're going to uh, define or formulate the collocation method of weight of residuals with global radial basis functions and define meshless methods, global and local meshless method. And then we're going to apply that to uh, heat conduction or heat diffusion problems. So we're going to make this problem transient now, depend on time. We're going to look at fluid flow problems. Okay? We're going to look at the Navier-Stokes equation. You're going to see how easy it is to treat them using this approximation of this technique, and then we're going to look into, if we have time, solid mechanics problem, problems, and that's the end of it. So uh, this class is kind of a compendium of many things. We look at three different, in detail, we look at three different techniques, numerical techniques, and we also look at many different applications, heat, flow, and solids in one class. So but obviously we are going to touch the surface. Uh, at UCF, I used to teach a class on boundary elements only, and I used to teach a class on meshless method only, and I used to teach a class called Advanced Numerical Methods that would just uh, introduce this and then some advanced linear algebra and all that, so it breaks it up into, into a bunch of things. But this touches the surface, and hopefully at, at the end of this class, uh, some of you might be interested in pursuing your research path in some of these directions, and then you can independently research more and get into this. All right, so uh, week 17 is finals week, and we, have, we don't have a final, obviously. That's the end of our classes, Thursday, the last day of class. Any questions? All right, so, uh, so we're good. So one of the books um, that I'm going to use for the class, 
Again, I don't require any book. I just suggest books. Uh, one of them is, is this book that I recently published with two, two of my co-authors. Uh, it's called An Introduction. Let's see if I can put it here. Introduction to Finite Element, Boundary Element, and Meshless Methods. Okay? So in this book, we show that you can relate these three techniques. Okay? And we show kind of the the chronological development of these techniques. Obviously, boundary elements from the 60s, I'm sorry, finite elements from the 60s, boundary elements from the 80s, and meshless methods from the 90s. Okay? This is when they came about and became popular, and then uh, uh, researchers started, started adopting them, and also uh, some commercial companies started writing code based on these techniques for solution of engineering problems. Okay? And, and so it's broken up into three parts, finite elements, boundary elements, and meshless methods, and this logo kind of tells it all. It's a kind of a progression between the three, but more importantly, the introduction of the book, that before you get to the three parts, is the method of weighted residuals. And how do we actually uh, can formulate all these three techniques, plus all the other conventional ones, meaning finite differencing and finite volumes from the same framework. Okay? Um, so this is uh, ASME Press. Uh, I have the chapters of the book in PDF. I can share that with you. Um, and uh, that way we don't violate any, any copyright because ASME obviously owns, owns the copyright. This was recently published uh, last year. So, um, all right. So, So the method of weighted decisions. So what does it mean? Well, the name says it all. It's a method by which you derive some residuals. And what is a residual? It's something that is not zero something that is nearly zero, but somehow you want it to make zero, right? That as much as, as, as the, the closer to zero you get, the better the solution that you're proposing. Okay, so you have a problem, and then you're proposing an approximate solution to that problem, and then you test that solution within a residual, within the framework of our residual, and then the closer that residual gets to zero, the better the approximation that you're proposing. And that's it. All right, so weighted means that in order to get to minimizing that residual, we use some weight functions, okay? Depending on uh, whether this residual is defined inside the domain of the problem or on the boundary of the problem or even outside of the problem, we use different residuals, uh, or I'm sorry, different weights. And then these weights are going to kind of control and dictate um, how this residual is minimized. And at the end of the day, the only thing that you're producing is discrete solutions to a problem that calls for a continuous solution. Okay, what am I saying by this? If I give you a heat transfer problem, or heat conduction problem, let's say, and there's a, an equation that governs the temperature, and there's some boundary conditions, you expect that the mathematical solution or the analytical solution is a continuous function over the entire domain and boundaries, including the boundaries, that represents the temperature. That's the solution of a heat conduction problem, the temperature, all right? And it's a global continuous function. It's a single function. When we apply a method of weighted residuals to be able to approximate the solution or the temperature in that domain and boundaries, what we're basically saying is we are okay with just obtaining discrete solutions. We're okay with obtaining solutions at specific points, with values of temperatures at specific points. We don't care how those temperatures are connected to each other. We don't care about having a global representation of the temperature, a continuous representation of the temperature. 
we're okay with discrete, we're, we're okay with scatter. Okay? Now, depending on the choice of weighting functions, or weight functions, the scattering might be different. It might be defined in the local scope over a subdomain. It might be the defined point by point, that's collocation. It might be defined slightly different on from the boundary inwards, or it might be defined from the domain outwards to the boundary. So that's what's, what, uh, how this is going to be dictated. So, MWR. So, consider a steady state heat conduction problem in 2D. Okay, we're going to start with a simple steady state heat conduction problem in 2D. And why do we do heat conduction? It's because it's governed by the simple Laplace equation. It's a linear equation. And uh, so let's say that this problem, this is your domain, and this is a domain we call omega. Domain. And gamma, we call boundary. This is the boundary of your domain. Basically, in this domain, we have the Laplace of the temperature of x, comma, y plus some energy generation, qg triple prime, divided by the thermal conductivity is equal to zero. And let's say that we have some boundary conditions. Let's say that from this point to this point, this part of the boundary, we call gamma t. This portion of the boundary we call gamma t. And in that portion of the boundary, t is prescribed. t at gamma t is equal to some prescribed temperature. So we are given the temperature along this boundary. And then on the remaining portion of the boundary, we call that gamma Q. And that portion of the boundary, we have minus K, the TDN, at gamma Q is equal to some Q. Some prescribed, that little hat means that it's prescribed, that it's known. So let's say the boundary is divided up into two parts. Remember, for a problem to be well posed, to be solvable, you have to have governing equation and boundary conditions. But the entire boundary of the problem needs to be covered by boundary conditions. You need to know boundary conditions at all portions of the boundary. Otherwise, the problem is not well posed. Okay? All right. So this is a well posed problem. So the assumptions here. Again, are that, uh, first of all, this is a steady problem, so there's no DDT. So you cannot see any DDT in the equation, because it doesn't exist. The problem is um, constant conductivity, constant conductivity. So the thermal conductivity is not a function of space. It's also not a function of temperature. So this is not a function, meaning that the conductivity is not a function of space, and it's also not a function of temperature. If the conductivity were a function of space, a prescribed function of space, then we call this a non-homogeneous heat conduction problem. Okay? or heterogeneous media heat conduction problem. If the conductivity was a function of temperature, then we call this a nonlinear 
a conduction problem. Right? We're not going to get into those complications yet. We're going to just keep it simple. In general, right, in this case. So the other assumption is that the entire boundary gamma is made up of gamma t and gamma q. And we have boundary conditions applied to all sections of the boundary. All right. So we can attempt an analytical solution. Okay, we have a linear problem. Again, so the governing equation looks like this. Laplace of t x y plus u g triple prime divided by k is equal to zero. That means that the second derivative of t with respect to x squared plus the second derivative of t with respect to y squared plus u g over k is equal to zero. That's the governing equation. It's a linear second order partial differential equation. So this is a linear second order partial differential equation. We call that PDE. Okay? So, from that standpoint, it's a simple problem. Second order linear PD. Depends only on X and Y. GE stands for governing equation. That's the equation that governs the temperature in the interior of the domain. Boundary conditions. We have T when evaluated at gamma T at that portion of the boundary that we call gamma T. And we call it gamma t precisely because that's what temperature is prescribed, is some t hat. It can be also a function of position, but it's just a temperature, let's say. And for now, let's just keep it constant. So this is called first kind Dirichlet, oh, this goes with capital D, Dirichlet, or forced. Boundary condition. And keep in mind, this is also linear. The other boundary condition states that minus k, the TDM, when evaluated at gamma q, is equal to some heat flux. That is the definition of heat flux. Is the negative of the conductivity times the normal vector times the normal derivative of the temperature along the, the boundary. That's it. Normal heat flux. And what we're saying is that we're prescribing the heat flux. Think of these as so in, in a portion of the boundary that we call gamma q, we put a, a foil, a heated foil or a resistance that we know we can control the intensity of, of heat. Okay? We call these type of boundary conditions. Second kind, Neumann, or natural boundary conditions. It's also linear. There's no nonlinearities in there or in the governing equation. We, know, we don't ever see a temperature square, or a temperature to the fourth, or a square root of a temperature, or a sine of a temperature, or a temperature multiplying the derivative of the temperature. It's all linear. We have temperature and its derivatives as linear combination of themselves. Okay? For example, a re radiation boundary condition would be nonlinear. Why is that? Because in radiation, the heat, the radiation flux, is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. 
So if you need to, if, if a radiation flux was to be prescribed, it would actually be proportional to the fourth power of the temperature, which will render that condition nonlinear. Non and it will render the entire problem, although well posed, not solvable analytically. Okay? Once you have a nonlinearity in the problem, the problem cannot be solved analytically. That's it. Very, very few specific, very simplified nonlinear problems can actually be solved by hand analytically. But for a problem to be solved analytically, all these conditions need to be met. A problem needs to be well posed, meaning that you have, a, you have to have a well-defined governing equation with thermal physical properties. In this case, the only thermal physical property is the conductivity. Everything needs to be defined in the governing equation. The governing equation needs to be linear. The boundary conditions need to be defined. They need to cover the entire boundary. We cannot have redundant boundary conditions. That means that we cannot have a portion of the boundary condition of the boundary where we have two types of boundary conditions. Okay? So we can have first kind all over, or we can have second kind all over the boundary, or we can have a portion of the boundary that's first kind, a, second, a portion of the boundary that's second kind. We cannot have holes of the boundary with no boundary conditions, and we cannot have overprescribed boundary conditions. So now this problem is well posed, well posed problem. This is a well posed problem, mathematically speaking, meaning a or an analytical solution may be available. Oh, and for those of you who remember my class, or if you took boundary value problems in the math department, or if you've taken partial differential equations before, you know how tedious it is to come up with an analytical solution. You have to do expansions and Fourier series, and you have to then use orthogonality, and, and then you have to use superposition, and so on and so forth. Okay? Well, here's the trick. The analytical solution may be available. And because of that, then a numerical solution is certainly available. If you can say that an analytical solution may be available because the problem is well posed, then well posed, then a numerical solution is certainly available. But it's approximate. It's an approximation to the analytical solution that we may never know what it is, but at least we know we can find something that is approximate. Okay, so if we go back to the problem, in this case, everything checks. Problem is defined, governing equation is defined, boundary conditions are defined. Therefore, uh, everything's linear, nice looking. The analytical solution is available. For an analytical solution, to be, in this case, determinable, the one thing that is, is that the solution is available somewhere out there, but in order for us to determine that solution, with the analytical methods that are known to the world, the geometry, that means gamma and omega, domain and boundary, must be framed into a separable coordinate system into a separable coordinate system. What is that? Rectangles, circles, cylinders, spheres, and that's it. I'm not even going to say etc. because that's about it. So, 
if you don't see a problem that looks where the domain looks like that or it looks like that or it looks like that that's it it cannot be solved triangles but when you say meshes, you're already talking about a numerical solution. I'm talking about an analytical solution. For an analytical solution to be determinable. Okay, we just determined that for this well posed problem, an analytical solution may be available. Now, the problem is not the availability of the solution or the existence. Now, it's the determinability of the solution. For us to be able to even attempt to get there, this has to also match. This has to also check. Okay, and hence the, uh, the, the phrase that mathematicians only know how to shave round sheep, okay? Because the methods exist, the methods are, av are available, the methods are powerful, and they're very useful, but only useful for idealized, very square looking or, or very circular looking problem. When we want, when we go to reality, okay, an airfoil, or when we go into uh, a machine element that is not necessarily any of these shapes, which the majority are not any of these shapes, then we have to resort to numerical techniques. Okay, we have to resort to meshes, or in our cases, non-meshes, okay, point distributions and things like that. So we have to discretize the problem. All right. So where is this? Therefore, uh, for general geometries our only goal is to resort to a numerical approximation that relies on discretizing solution field and the solution itself. Again, what do I mean by discretizing? Making it discrete instead of continuous. Okay, I'm not really, I don't really care to know the continuous distribution of temperature, whether it is sines, cosines, and exponentials, or whatever it is. If you can tell me that at this point the temperature is this, and at this point the temperature is this, and at this point the temperature is this, I can join those values together with polynomials or whatever I want. I don't care. Okay? I just want to make sure that those discrete values, and that's why I say by discretizing, those discrete values are as accurate as possible. Okay? All right. So... What do we do? So, the basic premise of the method of weighted residuals, and this is how I'm going to uh, denote uh, method of weighted residuals from now on, is to approximate the solution field in terms of a set of prescribed trial functions. And I'm going to call those trial functions phi j of x and y. And when I say prescribed is because I can arbitrarily decide what those are going to be. So I'm going to say that T squiggle 
is equal to the summation from j equal 1 to n of some alpha j phi j of x and y. That is the basic premise. Okay? I'm going to take the solution and I'm going to approximate it like this. So let me include a legend here. P hat is approximate temperature field. Um, N is number of trial functions. Alpha J or expansion coefficients to determine. So we have an n number of trial functions that we arbitrarily prescribe. We can pick whatever we want. We can say, I'm going to pick all these polynomials. And then the whole point would be, well, how do I choose? If I already chose those phi's, how do I come up with the alphas that make this temperature be as accurate as possible or as, as approximate as possible to the hypothetical exact solution, which I don't have? Okay, It's kind of a long shot if you think about it. You don't know the exact solution. You're setting this up this way, which is already complicating things a little bit because you're adding a summation of functions, and somehow I want to find some alphas so that I can make this temperature as approximate as possible to the exact solution that I don't have. Okay. Um, the only obvious requirement here is that the trial functions the n trial functions, pj of x and y, are linearly independent of each other, or from each other. What does that mean? Well, if I pick one to be x squared, I cannot pick the other one to be 3x squared because there's a linear dependency. One is three times the other at all points or at all values of x. But I can pick x squared and I can pick x cubed. Those two polynomials are perfectly linearly independent from each other. And then I can pick x to the fourth. Those are three linearly independent functions. And I can pick as many as I want. I can set n to be 100 and pick 100 different polynomials okay, of n order. Okay, I can pick one x, x squared, x cubed, all the way to x to the power of 99, if I decide n to be 100. Okay. So let's see how this works. So now we don't know the exact solution. The exact solution is unknown, but we know what constrains it. What constrains the exact solution? Well, the governing equation plus boundary conditions. We don't know the exact solution, but we know it has to satisfy governing equation and boundary condition. We know it is constrained by that. So at least we know some direction, something to drive this approximation. Now, let's go back to the governing equation. See, the governing equation states that the Laplace of t plus ug triple prime over k, which is known, all these things are known, which is the second derivative of t with respect to x squared, 
The second derivative of t with respect to y squared plus ug over k is equal to zero. Whatever that t is, that has to be true. Okay? And it is equal to zero. If I introduce a function here that is not quite t, what's going to happen? It's not going to be zero. But if I make it close to zero, that might mean that the solution I'm testing is good enough. Okay? So what I'm going to do is introduce these approximate or this approximation t hat of x and y, t squiggle, squiggle means approximate, hat means prescribed, into the governing equation. Which means that if I do say that the Laplace of t hat of x and y plus ug triple prime over k, then no longer this is equal to zero, but now we're going to call this equal to a residual, and that residual we're going to call residual omega, which may be a function of x and y. And it would be a function of x and y. It's going to yield different values at different points in the domain. Okay? Then introduce t hat on boundary condition at lambda t. And I'm going to frame this. And then what do we have? We have that t had, when evaluated at lambda t, minus the t prescribed is not zero anymore, is going to be equal to a residual, which we're going to call lambda t, or gamma t, of x and y. Is that clear? The originally prescribed boundary condition says that t was equal to t hat. All right? Now it's not necessarily the same. The difference between the two is no longer zero. It's now a residual. And now introduce t would squiggle on BC at gamma Q. On the other portion of the boundary where the flux is now imposed, and now in that case we have minus K dt squiggle dn when evaluated at gamma Q minus Q hat, that's the one that's prescribed, that's the one that we know, now this is no longer zero because this is an approximate solution and that's going to be equal to R gamma Q of X and Y. So in this case, X and Y belong to omega. In this case, X and Y belong to gamma T. In this case, X and Y belong to gamma Q. All right. Now, if we somehow, by some miracle, manage to make these three residuals equal to zero simultaneously, if we manage to make our omega, our gamma t, and our gamma q 
vanish, go out domain and boundary simultaneously, then we have found the exact solution. That never happens, by the way. Okay? So in that case, T squiggle of X and Y is just simply T of X and Y. It's a solution. So the chances of that are just as likely as winning the lottery. Um, so what we settle for is something that gives us something that's really close to zero for all these residuals. So this is uh, not very common. So we just settle for an approximation Squiggle that minimizes the three residuals. R omega, R gamma t, and R gamma q simultaneously. Now, remember that this T squiggle depends on some prescribed trial function that you pre-selected before you even started, and that the only thing that you are after are the alphas, some coefficients, okay, and values of alphas. So, depending. on our choice of trial functions, for the approximate solution, the squiggle of x and y, Some of these residuals may be forced to be zero, which differentiates the method of weighted residuals as. So basically you can pick the trial functions to so that the residuals on the interior are automatically satisfied. Basically it's automatically set to zero. And then just worry about the boundary. Or you can set the trial functions so that the boundary conditions are automatically satisfied. And then you just worry about minimizing the residual in the interior. Or you can have mixed methods where none of the residuals are set to zero. And you just minimize all of them simultaneously. So this basically means that you have one interior methods. And in this case, the trial functions automatically satisfy the boundary conditions. Therefore, residual gamma t and residual gamma q are zero.
and residual omega is different than zero and it's minimized to determine the alphas. This is called an interior method. In the boundary methods, trial functions automatically satisfy the governing equation. Therefore, our omega is equal to zero, and r gamma t is different than r gamma q, which is different than zero. These are minimized to determine the alphas. Just remember the whole construct of these surrounds determining the alphas. The trial functions are all arbitrary, but the arbitrary nature of these functions can be set so that they automatically satisfy the governing equation, they automatically satisfy the boundary condition. And then three, mixed methods. In this case, trial functions satisfy neither the boundary conditions nor the governing equation. Therefore, the residual on the domain is different than the residual on the boundary uh, T, which is different than the residual on the boundary Q, which is different than zero. And these are all minimized, all minimized simultaneously. These are all minimized simultaneously. to determine the coefficients of the J's. All right, we're gonna stop right here and then we're gonna just make additional classifications and then so far the weight functions are, haven't come into play. Okay, we just determine the residuals. The wave functions are going to come into play when we try to minimize those residuals. All right. So, any questions before we go? So, I'll see you on Tuesday. And have a, have a nice long weekend. Remember, there's no class on Monday. Or not, the university is not functioning on Monday. It's always weird when how schools lined up right where it's always